I'd like to thank everybody who's joining us today. Welcome again to CNCF's webinar for Vega, Rethinking Storage for Streams. I'm Christy Tan, Marketing Communications Manager at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Flavio, Flavio Junquera, Senior Distinguished Engineer at Dell. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and, is, and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, be, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Flavio to kick off today's presentation. Thank you, Chrissy, for, for the introduction. Uh, first off, I, I want to thank everyone who is able to join today. I know we are going through difficult times across the globe. And, and I appreciate you taking your time to attend the presentation, maybe learn something new. I see that actually, actually as an opportunity to get away from the overflow of information about COVID. So hopefully you'll be able to learn something new today about streams, about Provega, and will be definitely worth your time. So as Chrissy mentioned, I'll be talking about Provega today, a project that uh, I have been working with the team for, for the past two years. Uh, before I get into Vega and its whole motivation, uh, how it works, architecture, all that. Let me tell you a bit about myself. I, I work for Dell, Dell EMC. I am a senior distinguished engineer there. I have been working on the, on the Provega project since 2016. So it's, it's a bit over uh, three years. Um, and my background is distributed computing. I was in research for a number of years. I worked at Microsoft Research, Yahoo Research. Um, I worked on a number of, uh, of uh, open source uh, projects, in particular, uh, ones in, uh, in Apache. I was uh, one of the people who started projects like Apache Zookeeper, Apache Bookkeeper, some of the prominent ones I have worked on. And, uh, and you have some contact information if you want to reach out to me uh, later on or follow me on Twitter. Now, so getting to the motivation for for Provega, for streams, um, a lot of the motivation for for systems uh, doing talk about streams and uh, and and processing streams, storing streams, is the many sources of continuously generated data. Uh, if we if we think about uh, more concretely, applications applications like I don't know, social networks or you have end users continually streaming up events, status updates, or if you think about websites where users are, are, um, are transacting, so they are purchasing, they are, uh, I don't know, bank applications where users are continuously producing, producing those events and, uh, and, and generating transactions. So those can be streams of, uh, of data that you want to collect and you want to process. But it's not only about end users, not only about you know, human beings on the, on the other side of the screen, it could be also about machines, it could be about uh, fleets of servers that you want to collect telemetry about, um, learn more about how the servers are being used, if they are operating correctly. All those are, are valid ways of uh, uh, valid applications uh, for which you need to collect such data. Other types of machines that, uh, that, that are interesting to, to think about and collect data from are, you know, these days we talk a lot about IoT, so sensors makes, um, makes a very good use case for discussions around um, streams, continuously generated data. And there is, uh, of course, all the, the conversations about um, uh, autonomous cars, connected cars that uh, will leverage stream processing as well. So there will be a good number of um, of, uh, of streams coming out of, uh, of all those machines, all those end users, and all of those might be a, a good source of, uh, of, of information or, or output for a good number of applications. And so if we think about the landscape that I'm trying to portray, we have 
on on the one hand, on the left hand side, we have again end users machines producing a continuous flow of uh, of data, and we want to be able to ingest that data, um, store it, and, and and process it, not necessarily just in those two stages. Maybe there are complex combinations of uh, of ingesting, um, processing, storing uh, a derived data set, and processing again and and composing stages of processing and storage in, uh, in ways that benefit uh, your business, your, uh, your applications. And so when we think about outputs that could be the result of those data pipelines, we, we can think of visualizing data in, uh, in different ways, ways that give us uh, more insight or just enable us to understand better the nature of, uh, of our applications, our devices. Uh, it could be alerts. If you talk about servers, you might want to learn uh, about problems that uh, your fleet of services is experience, experiencing. You can get insights about your your customers, uh, recommendations based on the on the use of uh, of uh, of other users, or even actionable analytics uh, things that uh, that you can use in uh, in your daily job or when you go visit a customer or uh, it could be even uh, between machines as well so all those are valid um valid outputs that you can think when you have all those streams available to you that uh, you can process and, uh, and and derive value from now one step down and, and talking a bit more concretely about use cases so we have seen I, I want to mention a, a couple of general use cases that, are, that we have seen. So we have seen, for example, fleets of drones where they, they have cameras and they are, um, they are recording, they're streaming that video, which you want to ingest and process. And, and people want to do that for different reasons. So, you, you know, that we have seen applications where you want to, you want to check the health of your cattle uh, to applications where you are checking, inspecting airplanes between flights, uh, say in an airport. So all those are, are examples of, uh, both of them are examples, perhaps a bit in, in two extremes of the spectrum, but where you want to use fleets of drones and you want to ingest those videos and, and even other telemetry, process the data and, and make sense out of it. And another interesting point is uh, those applications, they they are interested in ingesting that data, processing it, and getting those insights in um, in near real time, right? So uh, essentially, as soon as as possible. But also, they want to come back eventually and reprocess it. So the ability of of getting results uh, with low latency, but also the ability of reprocessing that data, they are important for this class of applications. And along similar lines, uh, we have seen like fact in factory floors uh, where you have maybe video cameras uh, recording videos of, uh, of pieces that are, that are being manufactured and you want to detect uh, maybe defects in those, in those parts. Uh, and so for that, you ingest videos, you process videos, and, uh, and, uh, and you get some output that gives an indication whether things are going right or wrong. And again, this, in, in this example, we also want to process the data as it comes in, but we might also want to um, reprocess data later if, for example, we missed something or maybe we found the problem in the way we're processing it. So that a big of reprocessing is, uh, is, is also relevant for such um, applications. Now, moving down one level and talk about streams, let's, let's um, Let's reason a bit about how we how we see streams of data. So the most natural way is to think about uh, a sequence of events uh, where these events are again coming from sensors, uh, servers, uh, end users, and so we are ingesting those events, and we are pending one after the other. That's a natural way of uh, of reasoning about uh, about streams. But in reality, it's not just a single flow like this. Um, I, we have some degree of parallelism, we, you know, we can have multiple servers, multiple sensors, multiple users. And so it's not really just one single sequence like that. It, it looks more like the figure that I, I have on the, on the slide, but we have again, multiple flows. But even that 
even that does not completely characterize uh, the, the kinds of data streams that, are, that are, I'm referring to. So data streams do not, are not necessarily constant in the way we had in the previous slide. So the traffic that you see in a, in a stream, even with the parallelism that I, I, I have added, that, that degree of parallelism does not, is not necessarily static or constant. So it could vary over time. So maybe at some point in time, the load drops, at some other point it increases, maybe this is periodic, maybe it happens when you, you, when you double the number of sensors you have or the number of servers you have. And so, and so a, a stream, a real stream looks more like this, where again, we have parallelism and, uh, and, um, and uh, the load fluctuates over time, either periodically or at, at uh, specific times. Another important property is that uh, th this is this can be unbounded. Such streams can be can be unbounded, so they can start, and you can keep collecting data for for as long as you your application runs. Traditionally, applications have split that data into fresh, recently ingested data and and older historical data, and, and in many cases even separated that data in, in different systems. And I'm, I'm going to call this the lambda way, referring to, uh, to, to the lambda architecture. But the ideal situation is that uh, we, we don't make that separation, right? And we see a stream as, as one unit, one flow of, uh, of data. Of course, you as a user, you have the rights of, um, of, uh, of deleting the data if you wish to, but you should also be able to store a stream for or stream data for as long as uh, as it makes sense for your application. And it's not all. It's not all. It's not all about writing, right? So reading is also important. So read scalability is another property that uh, of any system that deals with data streams needs to incorporate. So the ability of, uh, of uh, dealing with these changes, dealing with the parallelism, dealing with the changes uh, to, to workloads also needs to be taken into account on the, on the read side when reading the stream. So that's the, the, the motivation for thinking about streams in, in the way we have, in the way we do in Provega. And in, per, the idea of Provega is, essentially to create this system for storing streams and having stream as a core primitive. Just like you have file systems or you have object systems, uh, we, we want to have a storage system that ingests streams and outputs streams. And at whatever point you decide to, to process that data, um, you should be able to read that in the form of a, of a stream. You should have no need of, a, of reading the data is storing somewhere else. And so properties that, uh, that uh, I, I just characterized and are important are to consider that the amount of data in a stream is unbounded. Uh, you, you might need to store stream data for corresponding to a very long time of, uh, of ingestion. It needs to be elastic to deal with the um, traffic changes that I have mentioned. It needs to be consistent. Uh, you don't wanna see duplicates or miss events in the, in the stream. And it needs to be to give you the ability of both tailing a stream and performing a historical processing over that same data. And those are properties that we believe are very important if you have a cloud native application. And uh, we wanted to offer that in the system so that I could play well with uh, all such applications. And that's, and that's essentially what Provega is and, and does. Now, so let's get into details of Provega now. So Provega builds on the, on the notion of, uh, of segments. A segment is a sequence of, uh, an append-only sequence of bytes, and it's the units that we store in Provega. Now, note that uh, it's bytes, not events, messages, or records. And this is important because it, it shows the flexibility that uh, our design gives. Uh, we can have uh, uh, an event API, but we, got, we can also have other APIs that, uh, that uh, do not have the notion of, say, events, messages, or records. And for events in particular, to give an example, we can rely on a serializer from the application, which will be, will be responsible for taking events and, uh, and transforming into bytes, and that's the final 
state data that we store. Now, when we talk about, um, the, so one of the things that a segment give us is the ability of providing parallelism. So an application that is writing to a Pravega stream is able to write to those uh, segments in parallel. Uh, so that gives us a, a high capacity for, uh, for ingesting data. Now, when an application is writing, you can use routing keys to map the particular, so if you're using the event API to map the particular events to segments. And in that way, we're guaranteeing a per key order. But across keys, we do not necessarily guarantee order. But again, that's at the cost of, uh, that's at the benefit of uh, giving, uh, providing higher performance or giving the parallelism that we, we're getting with the, with the segments. Another benefit we get from reasoning or thinking about segments is the ability to scale streams. So we can start, uh, say, like we have in, the, in this example, we, have, we start with two segments, then we can go to five uh, at some point because our, our load is higher. And then at some later time, uh, we can scale down because the workload, is, um, because the workload is, uh, has dropped. So those are operations that we can perform because again, we, we have this notion of segments. We can, um, we can see the segments and we can create new segments and, uh, and compose that in, a, in the stream. Segments are also used when we when we uh, when we execute transactions. So when an application creates a transaction in Prevega, we create temporary segments. Uh, we call them transaction segments. So the application, as the application is writing events to the transaction, it's writing to those transaction segments. So there's no interference between the events that are being written to the transaction and and the events that are being written to the main segments of, uh, of the stream. So those, th that data that is being written to the transaction segments, they're only, they only become visible and part of the primary segments of, uh, of the stream once they, are, once they are committed. And once a commit happens, then those segments are merged. Now, if for any reason the application uh, doesn't want that transaction anymore, it can abort and the transactions are, are, are deleted. And there is no trace of, a, of, the, of the data after that. So again, there's no interference between the transaction and the primary segments in the case of, a, of aborts. We can also use segments, uh, for example, to implement uh, replicated state machines. We have the notion in Provega of revision streams where we have conditional appends. So we compare we compare offsets when uh, when appending, and that only happens if the if the offset matches. Uh, we use that property to implement a, a a primitive called the state synchronizer, which we both expose in our API and we we use it internally. I haven't talked about reader groups, but we use in uh, in the coordination of our reader groups. And in general, as I have just mentioned, we can implement replicated state machines with it, and uh, and um, and that is done with optimistic concurrency. Now let's focus on a, a bit on one of the features that I have just mentioned, which is stream scaling. That's that's an interesting one. It's one of the of the key no, novel features of of Provega. So scaling a stream consists consists of dynamically changing the set of segments of the stream. So you can, for example, start with a single segment. And, and later, uh, we decide that uh, we need a higher degree of parallelism and create new segments. So it can go, say, from one to two. We have the ability of scaling, scaling automatically. So if you configure a stream to auto scale, then, uh, then Provega will internally track the load and, uh, and, and, and scale accordingly. But also, the, you have the option of, uh, of manually scaling streams in Provega. And you can think of them as, as proactive versus reactive. So for example, if you anticipate that your workload is such that uh, you will need uh, a higher degree of parallelism, you can go ahead and, uh, and, and menu scale it ahead of time. Uh, while auto scaling is reactive, as it observes that the load has changed, then uh, it will react and, uh, and scale accordingly. 
So those are the two mechanisms that we offer as part of, uh, of scaling streams. Now, looking in, in, in more detail um, how this works, let's, let's look at, a, at a, say an abstract example before we go into a more concrete one. So we start with a single, with a single segment. Remember that I said that uh, the, the, in the case of events, we map events to segments according to, uh, to the routing key space. So we have the space between zero and one. And I'm starting with uh, one single segment. So, so all keys will map to the same segment. Now let's say that uh, we have a pair of keys that, uh, that, uh, that are hot. And so that induces uh, a scale up event. So we split segment one into two, um, two equal segments of, um, of equal length, segments two and three. And that keeps going. At some point we decide that uh, that's not enough. And, and oh, actually, let me, let me give a, an example first. So let's, to understand this a bit better, say that those those keys are representing locations in a geo application. All right. So say that uh, we talk about taxi rights and uh, and you you're looking at a specific rights from people in a in a particular city. So some particular location can be hot because of an event, and uh, and that could induce such a such a, a higher load in a, in in to give for a couple of keys or a number of keys. Now, but let's say that that's not enough. I say that that's not enough. And now we end up splitting again into segments four and five. Um, and, it, and that keeps going until the point that uh, those keys become code, they go back to code and Pravega realizes that the traffic is not, uh, is not hot as it was before and, and it can, the two segments can be merged into one single segment. And so that's the, that would be the end state of, uh, of the stream. Now, one important observation here is that um, as, as the segments in the stream are changing, as we have these dynamic changes to the set of segments, a single key does not necessarily map to the same segment over time. And that does not require anything specific from the application. The application doesn't have to do anything specific about it. So Pravega under the hood manages those, uh, those assignment, assignment of keys to, uh, to, to the specific segment. So if we pick, for example, point nine, we'll see that uh, initially it points to segment one, then it maps to segment two, then to four, then to six. And, and again, under the hood, Pravega will manage that, uh, those, um, those changes for you and that will be transparent uh, to the application. Hey, Flavio. Now, let's um, look at the, this heat map. Hey, Flavio. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Chrissy. Oh, we just had a question come through the Q&A. Do you want to answer it now, or do you prefer to wait till the end? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this. I'm going to talk about storage okay. in a second. I haven't talked about the architecture. Yeah. <laughs> Great. OK, sounds good. Thanks. Okay, so heat map. So th this is the heat map we generated uh, from, from a re-execution. This is in one of our test clusters. And what we are seeing here is the set of segments over time that we, over time that we have. The color represents the, the, the loads in that given segment um, at, at a given time. So it, if, if it looks, if, if it looks red, then the work is, the, the workload's higher in that segment. If it looks like light blue, then it's, uh, the workload's lower. So that's the spectrum you will see uh, at the bottom of the, of the heat map. And the white you see is the split between, between segments. So we, starting from the left, we see a good number of, say, white, right? We, which indicates a good number of segments. As we move towards the right, we see we see that the number of segments reducing, which kind of indicates that uh, the, the, the workload is, is dropping enough that segments need to merge. And we can also see that based on the, on, on the color of the segments, like the, the light blue colors in, the, in those segments. Down to a minimum, that starts at around, I don't know, maybe 2.30 uh, and, and, and goes all the way to uh, 
a, a bit over 5.30 a.m. Uh, so there's a minimum of two segments around that time. And then from 5.36 a.m., it starts to pick up again, right? We, we start seeing segments splitting, um, a, a good amount of red, which indicates that uh, the segments are hot. And, uh, and then we have, uh, we have a, a larger number of segments around that time. Now, we have generated this graph with uh, We have generated this graph with a workload from this New York City yellow taxi trip records. So BRL is, uh, is at the bottom of, uh, of the slide. And we can see that those changes to segments, they follow the, the workload that we observe in here. So as we move from left to right, we can see the workload dropping down to a minimum around 4 a.m. And then, and then around 5 36 a.m. starts to pick up again right so and this is precisely the fact we wanted to see uh with respect to scaling right so as as the workload changes as it drops we need fewer segments as it goes up uh we need a, a larger number of segments and need more parallelism so if we put those two graphs together we can see we can see again that uh, on the left hand side we have a good amount uh, of merging of, uh, of segments and and on the right hand side we see segments splitting as the as the load picks up so that's a, that's an illustration of what we expect to see for a stream scaling in a, in a production application now let's talk a bit about the the, the Pravega architecture so one of the questions that, uh, that we got was uh, about the, the storage subsystem so let's let's talk a bit about not only that, but other aspects of the of the architecture. We when writing to Provega, so if we, if we focus on events, we have event writers. They append to a Provega stream, so we, a Provega stream, and we can have a number of parallel segments. Uh, we track writer position so that uh, so that we can ensure that in the case of connections dropping uh, and and restarting that are we able to resume from uh, from the correct position um, we also have readers right that can read those events uh, we group readers into what we call reader groups and reader groups you split the segment load across the readers in the group they also balance the load across those readers and we, we can add, we can grow and shrink that set by, uh, by adding and, and removing event readers. So that's one of the data that, uh, that we provide. And that, that's the case even not in the presence of stream scaling that we have just, um, we have, we just talked about. Internally, Pravega has two core components. One is the controller. The controller manages stream metadata, uh, the life cycle of uh, of uh, of streams, and and also it manages transactions. Now, the second element, which is a segment store, focuses entirely on segments. So the controller is re is responsible for making sense of uh, of uh, of segments uh, and exposing the abstraction of streams to applications. So stream is not a concept of the of the underlying storage. Right of the segment store, it's a concept that is exposed by uh, by the controller. The segment store manages the life cycle of segments and uh, and stores segment metadata. We use uh, tiered storage in in the segment store. The first tier is uh, a tier that provides low latency for for small writes, and we use Apache Bookkeeper for that. And we have a second tier, which is, is what we call the, the long-term storage, and that can be implemented with file or object. So we have different bindings for, uh, for, for different systems. So you can plug uh, an, NFS, uh, an NFS mount, or you can plug up an object store. Those uh, would work with Provega. So that's, uh, that's pluggable in our system. We also use Apache Zookeeper for uh, for a few things, for um, for coordinating the the uh, for the segment containers the split of of workload across segment store instances, and for doing um, a few things around transactions as well. Let's have a closer look at uh, at how the write and read path work. 
So the right path is such that when an event stream writer wants to append events, uh, the first thing we'll do is contact the controller to determine what, what is the segment store that he needs, to, uh, he needs to append to. And that's based again on the assignment of, um, of, of work to the different segment stores. So once it learns from the controller, it can talk, you connect to the segment store and, uh, and start appending bytes, uh, the bytes from, uh, from the events. Uh, it will, those writes will be pers persisted to, to Apache Bookkeeper. So we will won't acknowledge to the event writer until we receive a response from Bookkeeper that that has been persisted and Apache Bookkeeper on, on its end will guarantee that uh, the data is persisted. Um, and the second tier, which I have mentioned for long-term storage, we don't write to it immediately. So we, we asynchronously move the data to the long-term storage, which enables us to trim data, to um, truncate data from, uh, from Apache Bookkeeper ledgers, which is the log abstraction that Apache Bookkeeper exposes. And as I have mentioned before, for long-term storage, we offer uh, different options. You can use, for example, HDFS or an NFS mount to, to serve as the, the long-term storage. On the read path, on, on the read path, um, the reader will follow sim, uh, similar, a similar sec a sequence of steps to contact the controller to know where to read from, uh, which segments are serving a particular segment. And the segment store will, will serve data from, from the cache. If it's a cache hit, then we'll, we'll serve the, the data immediately, which is the case when you're taking a stream. But if you're performing a uh, historical reads, then it's most likely it will be a cache miss and you will read data from, uh, from long-term storage. So that's essentially how the read and the write path um, work. I, I want to switch gears now and, and talk, uh, talk a bit about how, connect, how Provega connects to, uh, to applications and in particular to stream processors, which is what I mentioned when I, I talked about the, the landscape of, uh, of applications. The main idea is that uh, we develop connectors. So we have a, a sync connector that, uh, that takes data and writes to, to a Provega stream. And you also have the other end, which is, the, which is when you want to consume data from a, from a Provega stream, that would be a source connector. So one example of a connector that, uh, that we have developed is, uh, is the flink connectors. You have the, you have the URL of the repository at the bottom of the slide. But that's the general notion of connectors. And we have developed a, a few of them. So there is the Apache Flink one I have just mentioned. There is one for Apache Hadoop. Uh, we have plugins for Logstash. There's a recent one developed by the community uh, for Alpaca. And there are more to come. Uh, there are some that are under development, development on our ends, and, uh, and hopefully we'll see more contributions from, uh, from the community. But here I want to focus on, on the Apache Flink one because that can, um, that can show some interesting aspects of, uh, of connecting a stream processor with, uh, with Pravega and the properties that, uh, that we can get. So Apache Flink is a framework that uh, enables, enables one to do two things. One is to write distributed, distributed processing applications. And the second is to deploy those applications in a distributed manner. So it's a framework that uh, enables you to, to write such code and, and also enables you to, uh, to run it. So it's a runtime for, uh, for such applications. And it's, it's able to process um, both uh, bounded and unbounded data sets and bounded data sets being, uh, being streams and bounded data sets uh, you could consider as historical data. Now the idea of using Provega with Flink would be that the the data the data from all the the sources continuously generating it, it that's ingested to Provega. Provega can serve both third-party applications or Flink jobs, uh, or we can have Flink jobs serving those consuming applications, or we can have uh, combinations of those. So the, the interesting um, the interesting aspect is that we can use this interleaving stages of, of processing and, and, um, 
and storage to build complex um, complex pipelines. And this is essentially the idea of, a, of, a, of this figure where we have, again, the data being ingested to Provega and perhaps you have multiple stages of, uh, of, of Flink jobs that, uh, that can give you the final output that, uh, that, that you need. And again, you can think of, uh, of applications where you, you want to do multiple stages. You, cannot, you don't want to do one single um, stage as one single run over the data, or you might, might want to derive some intermediate data sets before, uh, before you get your final output. So when reading from Provega, when reading from Provega, a, uh, what's called a source task, in, or source tasks in, um, in Flink, each one of them will execute a Provega reader. So the, the, the set of Provega readers across the source tasks will form a reader group and they will split the load of segments across them and, and even deal with the changes to segments uh, that could happen because of scaling. And all that complexity, as I mentioned before, is hidden from the application. The application doesn't have to, uh, to deal with any of those changes to the, to the set of segments. Now, one interesting, one important uh, feature that, uh, that we expose and that Flink leverages is checkpointing. We, we, give, we give the ability of getting a position across the, 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 set, the segments of a stream so that, uh, so that Flink can use that as part of its own checkpointing mechanism. So when the master of a Flink job is ready to take a checkpoint, it will request from the reader group a checkpoint. Internally, the readers will coordinate via state synchronizer. And as part of that, each one of the readers will emit a checkpoint event. And that checkpoint event is going to trigger the, 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 the following steps of the Flink checkpoint uh, mechanism. And finally, when that process completes, the master receives a checkpoint and stores that as part of the, of the metadata of a checkpoint that, uh, that the job requires. And we'll see in a second why that's important for, um, um, for exactly one semantics end to end. A bit of code, you can, you can create a, a Provega source by creating a Flink Provega reader from the from the the connector i have mentioned so to do that you pass a Provega config you tell which stream you want to read from uh, a serializer and uh and you can use that as a source in a in a flink as part of a flink job so you can see more detail in uh, in our repository containing samples if you're interested now let's move to talk about writing so when writing if you, I'm going to skip that at least once uh, a part and focus entirely on, on the exactly once part, which uses transactions um, to write back to Provega. So if you have a job that you're processing data, say you're reading from a Provega stream and, and you're processing and now you're dumping to, a, to another Provega stream, that will happen in the context of transactions. And so to make that work correctly, uh, Flink will execute a, a, a two-phase commit-like protocol. As I mentioned, you also have the option of, of disabling that and using at least one semantics, in which case you won't be using transactions. Um, so the way it works is the, the Flink master will start the checkpoint. You will do, you execute those steps I mentioned previously. And, and that's the step that I'm calling prepare, right? So when, when it starts that, uh, that process of checkpointing, you will push marks, which will flow through the, through the, the data graph of, um, of a Flink job. When those marks re, uh, reach the sync tasks, they will acknowledge that to the Flink master. The Flink master, uh, once he hears from all source uh, sync tasks, it will complete the checkpoint, indicating that to the sync tasks. And at that point, they will commit um, their corresponding transactions. So that flow uh, guarantees that uh, the data that, that data is being processed in, uh, in an exactly once manner. So this is all again some code now to uh, to write a sync with the Flink Provega writer uh, here. Uh, again, you need uh, you, you can pass the Provega config, tell which stream you're gonna write. Um, you're gonna write to uh, have an event router 
for uh, to, to route to specific streams using uh, I'm here using the exactly once mode, a serialization, etc. And then you can add that as part of a of a, of your job. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about Flink. Let me now talk a bit about uh, Pravega on on Kubernetes. So we have we use operators in a in a few places. So an operator is a custom controller for managing the lifecycle of an application. In our case, an application is uh, is is Pravega, but it's also other systems that we use along with Pravega. For example, Bookkeeper and uh, and Zookeeper. And it does automation on a, on a number of, uh, of dimensions, uh, deployment, uh, configuration, I don't know, making sure that uh, 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 looking at pod disruption budgets, uh, looking at, uh, at uh, pod affinity, affinity and anti-affinity rules. Uh, so those are uh, all, all, um, properties that, are, that it looks into. So scaling uh, elements of, uh, of the system, uh, performing upgrades. So, for example, in Pravega, upgrades are managed by the by the operator, um, and also monitoring the the health of uh, of the different elements of uh, of the system. So, as I had mentioned, we we do we have a number of operators. We have a, a Pravega operator, which focuses on the on the core elements of uh, of Pravega controller and uh, and segment store. So we have the Pravega operator for that. And we have uh, a couple of other operators, one for Bookkeeper and one uh, for Zookeeper. So you can see the the, the repositories uh, listed in the in this slide. And if you're interested in more information, you can uh, you can go check the our documentation. All right, so that's um, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. So I'm ready to wrap up. Uh, in conclusion, we I motivated the work of of stream processing of Pravega that's coming from the the needs of processing this multitude of sources that are continuously generating data. I've talked about end users that are continuously producing events or performing online transactions. Uh, I mentioned IoT sensors, um, servers, uh, drones. Um, all those are potential sources of, uh, of, uh, of continuously generated data that we want to ingest and process, not necessarily in a, in a tailing manner, you know, tailing that data as it comes in, but also being able to reprocess at any, any arbitrary time. Provega aims to be a, a critical piece of that, of that puzzle, in particular provides providing a stream as a storage primitive. So Pravega is a storage for, uh, for data streams, and it provides important properties for, uh, for such applications. Uh, it's, it's able to ingest uh, uh, an abundant amount of data on a per stream basis. It gives you elasticity uh, based on our auto scaling feature, and it gives, uh, it gives us the ability of a uh, of, uh, of guaranteeing consistency for the data that, uh, that is being ingested and also the data that is being read in the way that I had illustrated with, uh, with Flink. To connect Pravega to, to stream processors, we, we have to build connectors. I have mentioned a, a few of them, but I have focused mostly on one example, which is Apache Flink. And I have shown how we can build uh, exactly one end to end using Pravega properties and, uh, and properties of uh, of the stream process. Pravega is open source. It's licensed under the Apache license uh, v2. It's currently hosted on GitHub. And one of the things that we're looking to is looking, uh, looking for a home for, uh, for incubation. So we hope to eventually hit uh, uh, some foundation and, uh, and, uh, and be hosted there. Now, before I close, uh, in the case that uh, anyone in here is interested in, in getting started with Pravega, I wanted to give a few pointers. There is, of course, the website pravega.io that, uh, that gives you a good amount of information, has good documentation on explaining parts of the system, how to run it, and, and such. There's, of course, the, the repository itself that you can go and check it out, um, see what kind of issues we are working on, uh, maybe pull requests, maybe interact a bit with, uh, with the developers. Um, you can run Pravega standalone. You know, you can fetch the repository, run standalone, and see uh, and see how it feels. Maybe you run some samples against that Pravega standalone. That also give you a feeling for uh, how to write code. 
uh, with Provega and what kind of features you can get. You can also try on Kubernetes, look at the repository and see and see the instructions for uh, for how to deploy there and uh, and all the features that uh, that we offer, and and throughout that process, um, you know, feel free to provide any feedback and even contribute that uh, if if you have a chance. And with that, I close. I uh, uh, will open up for questions. I have a number of pointers here in the case you're interested in checking any of the things that I have mentioned today. Thank you. Great, thanks Flavio for a great presentation. Um, as Flavio mentioned, it's now time for the question and answer piece of the webinar. Uh, so we've got about 10 minutes. Um, Flavio, I'll go ahead and read um, some questions for you. So the first one that's from Vijay is, do Provega or does Provega have geo replication in its roadmap, something similar to Pulsar? Yes, it, it is in our roadmap. It is in our roadmap. We, we don't have that yet, but it's clearly um, a, an important piece and we'll do it. Great. Okay, the next question is from uh, Sharif and apologies if I'm butchering these names. Uh, is there a SQL slash SQL uh, compatible layer that can be used to query data in Provega? Something similar to KSQL for Kafka? Also, does it have a Presto connector? Right. Um, you you can you can do uh, SQL like queries with Flink, so you you could use that. Uh, as for Presto, we don't have a connector yet. It is that's another thing that is in our roadmap. Great. Uh, this question is from Anderson. Uh, Provega can be used in a serverless architecture. Lambda functions. Oh, asking if Provega can be used in a serverless architecture. Yes, absolutely. That's another thing that uh, that uh, that we're thinking about. That's another thing that we, we're thinking about, and we definitely add some um, some functionality in that uh, in that sense. It is actually very 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 good questions. Uh, all things that uh, we we are looking to getting, and so you know, if any of you is interested in contributing, we are happy to hear your uh, you know your opinions. Uh, you know, get your contribution and uh, and analyze it. Those are all great um, great questions. Yeah, it looks like we have another one that just came in uh, from the Uh Does Provega have predictive analytics capabilities? Um, Provega, Pr Provega itself is only the storage bit, the storage bit. So if you wanna, if you wanna connect to anything that performs the analytics, like we, I have described with Flink, that's um, th that makes total sense, right? So Provega gives you the ability of ingesting the streams and uh, and reading from those streams, and you know, be doing that in a way that uh, that you can ingest data for arbitrary amounts of time. You know, the architecture I have explained allows you to keep data for as long as you like. And so, in that sense, this is um, th this is great if you're looking to into processing uh, a large amount of data for, say, I don't know, training a model. Right, so all those um, those properties of the system, of the storage system, give you the ability of uh, of doing those things. Uh, but again, if there is any system in particular that uh, you're interested in, in using, there should be nothing that prevents you from uh, from writing a connector or even working with us on uh, on writing a connector. Great. Looks like we have uh, time for a few more questions. Any last minute questions? Please drop them in the Q and A box. We'll give folks a minute here. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So great, thanks again, Flavio, for a great okay, presentation. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I spoke too soon. <laughs> Is there a Provega Lite version with built-in tier two support? Uh, Provega Live version with built-in tier two support. So, um, not really. So, so Provega itself, Provega will connect to the tier two you provide. If if a built-in means that you want to use a local um, a local storage, in principle you can do that. 
it won't be it won't give you like a lot of capacity right because one of the ideas is that for tier two is that uh we we have elastic storage right for long term for only storing data long term and so in that sense uh i, I would not recommend doing that um we have thought of the ability of not having tier two but that's not a feature we uh we offer today Okay, and uh, Sharif is asking, have you done some benchmarking against other streaming solutions, example, Kafka or Pulsar? We have, we have. Um, the, the performance we're observing is comparable to both of them. Uh, of course, there are differences you observe uh, depending on the case based on the, on the architectural differences. But, uh, but unfortunately, I don't have numbers that I can share with you right now. Uh, we'll, we'll have something soon. But we, ha yeah, so we have been looking to that. Okay, and Tom is asking, I think this will be our last question. How does Provega identify bottlenecks in tier one and tier two storage? How does Provega identify bottlenecks in tier one and tier two storage? Uh, yes. I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so, so if, if this is asking about throttling, right, if the question is about throttling, uh, we do try to look into uh, the, the traffic that is going, you know, the, what's incoming versus what's going to, uh, to, um, to, to tier two, so that the amount of data saying bookkeeper doesn't grow without bounds, and we apply back pressure. Um, to decline. Okay, great. Well, oh, sorry, I keep saying that one last last question here. Is there any docs or POCs to do with CDC with Provega connectors? Um, I don't think so. So you can look at samples if you see if there is anything there that uh, that suits your needs. Provega samples, that's the, well, I, I didn't list it here. So it's one of the repositories in our, in our organization. Great, okay, well, that is all the time that we have today. Um, I wanna thank you all again for joining the webinar and thanks Flavio for the great presentation. A reminder that the slides will be available later today on the cncf.io slash webinars uh, page. And thanks again, and we hope to see you all at a future CNCF webinar. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you, Christy.